The crate are aggressive, vicious, and intelligent. They lay eggs and keep hatcheries. Both males and females are given education and battle training, and both genders perform all general societal functions. Crate are capable of surviving outside the water, but they prefer to build their cities and towns deep beneath the waves. Their cities are often built around one or more of the great obelisks, and usually contain underwater hatcheries, arenas for gladiatorial combat, and long lines of glowing road markers. These incandescent paths are visible even to those swimming some distance above. The crate are ardent mathematicians, constantly using maths and numerology, as well as magic, in a constant attempt to determine the date of the prophet's return. Crate are very flexible and are excellent swimmers. They have three stages of existence, larval, adolescent, and mature. Larval crate are weak and fragile. They're kept in guarded hatcheries until they master swimming and basic life skills. Adolescents serve as scouts. Mature crate exhibit the strength and dedication for which their race is famous. All crates are willing to die if necessary so that the crate beliefs and race can survive. The spirits of the wild quicken my breath, heat my blood, and embolden my heart. It's like you looked into my own head and ripped the words my detected. On our way today to the Battle of Fort Trinity, sort of a, a, a victory and a loss at once here for Caraflower, intercepting the orb. A patient, I ambushed the crate caravan that transports their mysterious orb, and I was able to defeat the crate and recover the orb but Apatia was carried off and captured both the orb and I are needed back at Fort Trinity so I swore to return and rescue Apatia kind of I mean we didn't really get a choice a Lagos we teamed up with just took the orb from us and teleported away and we need to make sure it's gonna be okay over there uh, but hey we are at the very southern climbs once again of Mount Maelstrom uh, having walked down past Firebreak 4 across the road uh, I did want to show you a little something here at Merkvale though which is uh, as you remember a swamp filled with undead right on Zaitan's doorstep and uh, has some Silvari looking into defenses of the area that maybe Caraflow would have something in common with. But in particular, there's a very interesting Crusader down here. Crusader, I'm guessing at this point we can all understand to be... Um, a title for the Pact members. This is Crusader... Apa no, no, no. Crusader Aliana. Okay. So, a uh, little bit of a, a slap of cold water in our face here, maybe, as we uh, relate her to the mysteriously now missing Apatia and how she's feeling. But check it out. It's a ghost. So, this is a human... Uh, quite a short human as well, actually, to tell you the truth. Uh, she's in packed stuff. Uh, she's at this little base by a campfire. What use a ghost would have for a campfire, I don't know. But uh, on the borders of this risen bog. Now, what she says is really quite interesting and can lead to a ton of discussion about Zaitan um, and how he operates, which the real lore hounds and nerds tend to find themselves doing. So, hey, I may as well uh, introduce and open this can of worms to you. Stand it has you already been discussed a little bit on the series before, particularly Cara Flower when she was around Gendaran Fields, if I recall correctly, in the defense of the Ascalon settlement. Uh, various things about this may have come up. So, here's a ghost, and she says... <sighs> something the matter. She says, oh, don't mind me. I'm just remembering my horrific death. I sense a story coming, says Caraflower. And Aliana says, my unit and I were sent out to abate the incoming risen forces, but I caught a chill the night before our big battle. I stayed behind while my unit went on to fight the enemy. <laughs> I'm going to stop here. Bye. Uh, what happened next? Well, my unit fell becoming the enemy we were sent to fight. And worse, they found me, still with fever, and tore me apart. Now my corrupted body fights for Zaitan. 
So kind of a cool story. You know, you always hear about the sole survivor just because they were ill and they just happened to not be at the place where disaster struck. Uh, here they talk a little bit about, you know, essentially this is a zombie story we're dealing with here. And it was just before games went really hysterical with zombie stories. So it kind of made sense to do a big dragon and do zombies, zombie dragons at the same time. That's perfect. That's all the big gaming trends covered at once, right? Uh, so we are kind of dealing with a zombie story and those ideas of, you know, you don't just die to Zaitan, you become his army. The game jabs at it quite frequently. This is one of those little jabs. Uh, and so here we hear she's not the sole survivor though. She, they come back and they kill her. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. She is just torn apart, uh, which is cool. So that that's one side of it. But here is the other side. She's a ghost that was uh, defeated by Risen. Now, not everyone who is killed by the undead becomes ghosts, right? Their ghosts do what? Move on to the afterlives, return to the underworld, are judged by Grenth, as we saw from Guild Wars 1 story. What actually happens to all of these spirits? Because it's not common. It's not like there's hundreds of spirits around all, all over the place. Most of them seem to move on. She hasn't. And you might be wondering now, hold on, isn't the idea then that Zaitan reanimates these bodies and captures the souls and keeps them with him. Well, that's kind of the question. She here became a ghost separate to her body, and she talks about how her body is corrupted and fighting for Zaitan. So according to Crusader Aliana, Zaitan doesn't do anything with souls, doesn't do anything with the ghosts, with the spirits themselves. He just takes the husks, the bodies, and they just amble around wildly on their own. Uh, so that's the interpretation that this gives us. But there are various other aspects of Guild Wars 2 that totally contradict this and make you scratch your head and wonder how the Elder Dragon really is working. Because, uh, for example, when you kill many Risen, they're, they're speaking to you and they say rest now and they talk about release and they seem satisfied to have finally been defeated and that they, you know, can move on or whatever. So are the souls still in there? Sometimes the devs suggest one angle. Sometimes they suggest another. Now, I don't have a list and, you know, a, a great um, uh, or, um, ordering of all the different facts so that we can compare and contrast them all. But it's kind of one of the funny little things, exactly what is going on with Zaitan's corruption. And then to frame and consider what that might mean for the other Elder Dragons. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Anyway, speaking of Undead and Zaitan, let's move on <coughs> to Fort Trinity. As we can see here in the Straits of Devastation on this cold, scary night for the Battle of Fort Trinity. I am going to run along the bridge and I will see you guys in there. Traherne, we think we might have something great for you. I'll tell you what, the one thing I really kind of don't like about this backpack is the way that it sways as we move. And all the butterflies sway with it. There you go. Now that you guys have seen that, you won't be able to unsee it. Like, look at this fellow all the way up here or over here now as he swings left and right frantically. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so, at the Plinth Timberland, the battle for FA. Commander, good to see you. Marshal Traherne is waiting for you. The crate orb we recovered is fascinating. It literally the prevents the dead from rising the again. Then I wish supplies. we had a hundred of them. How does it work? Can we replicate it? Not so far. The only thing we know for sure is that it's steeped in powerful magic. As long as it works, we can figure out why it works when the war is over. Zaitan's forces are coming. Why aren't the Asura gates functional? I'm sorry, Marshal. We can't seem to isolate the problem. It could be our proximity to ore. Or maybe we've got a saboteur. This is critical. Without those gates, we're cut off from any reinforcements. All right, so there we go. We understand the orb a bit better now. Greetings, Commander. I was sorry to pull you out of the field, but you and the crate orb you discovered are needed here. I go wherever you need me, sir. But I'm not through with those crates yet. They have a Pesha. How are things here? Fort Trinity seems to be shaping up well. I hope so. We've seen a huge increase in undead activity while we've been establishing our defenses. I believe a major attack is imminent. All the signs are there. Our outermost defenses have suffered a series of probing attacks, and we've lost several long-range scouts. We have the orb and powerful explosives developed by our top demolitionist, but there have been disturbing glitches in communication. Fort Trinity is not yet secure. Worst of all, our Asura gates are not functioning, and nobody can tell me why. Magical or mechanical failure, saboteurs, 
It's all very disturbing. I want you to double check our defenses, starting with the lumber camp. They've lost a lot of workers, and we need that timber. You take point. Okay, cool. So we have a bit more context as to what's going on here. Isn't it amazing how we haven't seen Caraflower hasn't seen Traherne for a while. Uh, you know, that entire story arc we just did there, there was absolutely no reason to go near him. While potentially, if the circumstances were a little bit more dire or dangerous, uh, other characters may have actually had that luxury. Now, I have to applaud the personal story here or, or take note of something here. Um, you guys probably have very little idea just how much work is going on behind the scenes to make things feel continuous despite the many branches and in many ways the developers fall down flat on their face with the personal story but one of the more impressive things uh, I've always felt is right here in that cutscene you might have noticed it there are very subtle differences based on our story and route through the game in that little conversation uh, in particular this one line here where is it uh, we have the orb and powerful explosives developed by our top demolitionist, but there have been disturbing glitches in communication. There's loads of ever so slightly tiny little tweaked versions of that specific line in the cutscene that is really quite beautiful to behold and look at just how tiny these little tweaks are just to make it kind of feel like it flows. Uh, so yeah, we've actually seen two different stories here, two big things Traherne's talking about. Uh, but as you're probably savvy enough to know, in theory there's a third as well, but we can only be left to speculate what exactly that is layered into this delicious little cake of uh, finesse. So, uh, yeah, there we have it. What's on your mind? Traherne, there's much to do. With many of our resources dedicated to the surrogate problems and the mystery of the Cray Orb, our defensive preparations are lacking. I have some questions. I'll bring you up to speed on our situation, but please, make it fast. We're running out of time. What's with the gates? If they function at all, they mal malfunction. I hesitate to call it sabotage, but so much on the line, I have to assume it's more than just a logistical foul-up. Tell me about the orb. Its presence prevents Zaitan's magic from reanimating any nearby dead. So he can still kill people. He just can't grow his numbers in that area, all right? So it's not like a, an immaculate defense. I've seen the comments. A lot of you guys seem to think the orb is, you know, this ultimate uh, gacha weapon for Zaitan. It just prevents him growing in the areas that it, you know, inhabits. I mean, there's kind of a sense that it repels the undead, sort of, but... Um, yeah, I don't think it's a 100% it's a, a solution. That's all we know about it. It's quite a mystery. I'm just glad we have it in the crate, don't. We have Sire to thank for that, he says. So Sire came here ahead of us. Uh, fortunately, I'd had dealings with her before, and she felt she owed me a debt. Lagos are dangerous, but honorable. This is uh, kind of amazing. We don't get to ask him what that debt is. Uh, her people would be a huge asset against the dragons, we point out, and that's true, right? Isn't it kind of convenient and nice that right on Zaitan's lair and doorstep we find out about a powerful race that's actually able to navigate these waters and things? They would be a great asset. Are they going to join the pact? Someday, yes. Lagos are proud and solitary people. We don't have the time or resources to recruit them en masse. Having the orb will have to do. Listen, this idea that they're solitary so you can't recruit them en masse that they're great hunters. The Lagos are so close to what the Norn seem to be getting set up as in the expansion on the original game. It's amazing. Uh, and yeah, this isn't really a spoiler. I know you guys don't like me talking ahead and I, I do try to stop it as much as possible. But just before anyone gets their hopes up, so far, as far as Guild Wars 2 has existed, this idea of recruiting the Lagos on map, uh, on mass, the idea of them becoming a playable race, it's not a thing. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, maybe something to still be excited about. Even here right now, the nerd recording this video for you is thrilled at the prospect because they've left it hanging. Um, I mean, the Lagos will have interactions, you'll see. But, yeah, that, that, that basic little line there, we haven't seen a resolution to. Uh, do we have enough heavy explosives? We do, thank the Mother Tree. I had the pack's finest demolitionists working around the clock. So, that's at least one thing we've got covered. All right, so, pff, one of us was sort of a success, it seems. Good. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is Fortune itself and the blue orb. So, there is no blue magic here anymore. And what you'll realize has happened is one of those unfortunate situations where the open world is a little bit further forward in the timeline than, um, than the story instance. In theory, when we first visit this place, we shouldn't see any blue magic pulsing through it. It's only later, once the blue orb is properly utilized, that the blue magic should appear. So I feel like maybe some of the early design ideas or what would have been nice for Guild Wars 2 is that first visit to Straits to get to the fort 
if instead you saw like a totally different kind of four or an alternate version of straights a bit earlier in the timeline by a few months back when this was not what it is now but it was a much more you know shallow husk the old ruins that Traherne spoke of way back at Claw Island that would have been really cool and then the line that Caraflower says wow you've really built this place up would have really meant something and been awesome um, but yeah, unfortunately, they didn't really do that. Uh, the game is of a caliber and a quality, though, with current expansions that they totally can and frequently employ tactics and stuff like that. That's just one of the ways in which the product continues to improve, and that's really, really awesome. All right, anyway, so it's a bit scary. It's called the Battle for Fortunity. Trahan seems to think that there's a lot of uh, Risen around, and it would make sense for Zaitan to attack, but so far, we see nothing. Now, lots to explore. But let's just go nice and safe. First, checking on this logging camp back out at the Plinth Timberland. I would love a little bit of region lore for each of these. The Plinth Timberland, isn't that a cool sounding place? Love to hear just a bit more about the history of that area. Uh, so yeah, we'll just follow the Starburst. There are various roads out of the forts. And believe me, this will not be the only time you see this road. Looking up there, you can see there's actually an airship uh, hanging eerily in the sky. And another one, just like the concept art shows. And another one. Oh, it's amazing, guys. Oh. You start seeing loads of airships at this point in the story. Not just one hanging over the vigil keep, but uh, they really kind of go ham with it. Right, so yeah, we spent her off of the road, and over here... Oh, there's some giant-ass char tanks. They would be pretty useful. How's everyone doing? We're behind schedule. Traherne needs more lumber to strengthen our fortifications. The last logging party we sent out is still missing. We have no idea what happened to them. Until we do, we can't risk sending any more. All right, organize a search party to find the missing robbers. Once we find... Oh my god. Okay, combat music starts. I love that. Okay, so they, the loggers have gone missing, and yes, it looks like they've been picked off by undead. What's kind of amazing there is in the middle of the... While the Asura is still speaking, and Asura is smart and perceptive. Well, not necessarily perceptive, but smart. The Char, from the Order of Whispers, just immediately stealths off and starts fighting. Just doesn't even care to listen to the rest of the Asura there. It's so cool the way that looked. Uh, so, yes. Okay, Risen. Don't worry. We will combat Zaitan's Risen with our own form of undead. Believe you me. Caraflower is well equipped. I mean, I don't even think Caraflower would be particularly scared around these. Cautious, definitely. But as a Silvari necromancer, come on. She's probably one of the least fearless characters you can play as in, in Guild Wars 2. Uh, maybe certain kinds of Norn and Char could also be very fearless. Uh, but the idea that the Silvari just aren't scared because then they don't know enough is kind of amazing to me. All right, let's take these guys out. we got to do something about our Scepter and Dagger. And uh, we do have one more trait to pick up today as well. Which, once we get, will represent a full Guild Wars 2 build. Three maxed out specializations. Two weapons, all elite skills, all utility skills, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, so, there are new varieties of Risen we're finding here. They don't they don't visually look particularly different. Looks like we've won for now. Thanks for the assistance, man. On my god. Secure the gate before they overrun the fort. Oh god, they're going for the fort, are they? Yeah, the reason that we'll be fighting here, these guys don't speak, I don't think, uh, will be... The war is truly upon us, Commander. We must show Zaitan we can take the worst it has to throw at us and throw it back tenfold. Oh my god, another victory here for us? Or oh, a horrible defeat? Yeah, the Orions have like coral and stuff on them and the, their designations and combat abilities change a bit now to be a bit more deadly, a bit more dangerous. So uh, we will see that as we get closer and even start wading through or... Oh dear, they slipped in behind us. Come on, guys. Look at this. The Priory with the Priory hammers there. Oh, Whispers people mixed in. It's fantastic. So, yeah, look at this here, right? You see, like, the reef and things on him. This is a Risen Putrefier, which does point-blank AoEs. These guys transfer condies. This is what made me think of it. So, I can condy him up, and then he might splash it all back onto me, and you can, like, one-shot yourself if you're not careful. I actually have a video from a long time ago where I was abusing a certain item in the game. And I killed myself off of a Rizzard. It was kind of hilarious just because they have that mastery of Condies, just like many Necros might. So our job here, to defend the gate. And that was a pretty big wave. Luckily, we have a lot of allies. We'll get our Flesh Reaver up soon as well soon. Uh, we can't break combat because our minions have gone ham. But as soon as we do, I will get that last trait for us before we have even more danger coming on us. We won't have very long. Looking over here, I'll probably pick up Bitter Chill. Whenever we chill someone, we vuln them. Actually, let's pick up Spiteful Talisman. 5% more damage, basically, as long as they have no boons, which they won't. Okay, a cutscene. Ah, uh, what is that? Giants? Okay. 
Now, you guys have seen giants, but not this many giants. We have seen a couple of giants before. It's fine. Uh, in the vision of all. But there's three more over there as well. We saw giants. We Don't need to get fool. back to the gate. Lord Trinity is in danger. Leave us and seal that gate. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is kind of crazy. Now, a giant takes a long time to kill, and they are really quite dangerous. Even with the arrow cart that they have positioned here. It would not be an easy job to take these things out. And they can kill us just straight up with enough stomps. Uh, get back to the gate. Is everybody coming back? Jesus, guys, come on. And the idea is we need to fall back. But don't worry. We have a fort. It's the po whole point of it is to be defensible. Uh, and you get two gate switches. Uh, we can press F on. Which we kick to spin the lever. We can come kick this one as well. And as we do so, it locks the door. And the giants don't know what to do. A couple of them literally standing around doing nothing there. Oh, okay, so that's one gate. Unfortunately, we locked some people out. But maybe the idea is they got another way in or something. I don't know. The game kind of glosses over that. Uh, the war is truly upon us, Commander. Okay, fine. Well done. Stick together. Together we can win. Okay, um, fear not, Commander. I shall protect you, says that random packed agent. So, our next job, defend the Fort Trinity docks. This is where we saw that they were defending, the, uh, escorting those dolly acts and things. Moving along, this place is pretty cool. You'll notice some giant badass lasers, which um, haven't fully, truly been established just yet. But never mind, never uh, fear, my friends. Maybe we will find that out before long. Uh, so, yeah, the docks, right. I guess Zaitan's just going to choose to come up where we would launch our ships from and our submarines from. And what's he got here? Risen Quagon, Risen Crate, Risen Lagos, maybe? Oh, what a formidable idea that, that is. I mean, the Risen Crate all on their own are pretty evil and scary seeming. Uh, so, yeah, we will defend ourselves from those as long as that front gate is holding itself. I'd love if the story could hit, you know, I just imagine the minds of the engineers to build such great anti Zaitan gates. All right, what's going on here? We got a cutscene? Oh dear, you see that in the shadows? Look at how cool this is way out in the mist. Those cannons firing. Oh, uh, it's another boat. Oh, uh, we're no stranger to this. Remain strong, I will indeed, Traherne. So, uh, we get a boat out there. Just like at Claw Island, Zaitan sends his navies. What's that I see up above? Something's above? Uh, well, we have airships up above. That's pretty goddamn awesome. Are you sure there's something above? Hmm, okay, defend the Fort Trinity docks. That's fine. I think we're going to want to try and sink that ship, guys. Does anyone have cannons and anti-siege for it? Surely we're not going to rely on an outdated Lion Guard Treb this time. You'll also notice, by the way, that boat is a lot bigger than the one in the previous story instance. The, the other one was really far away, granted. but this one And this one's closer, but it is a lot bigger. Something above. You guys have got me freaked out a little bit now. We know what kind of dragon Zaitan has at his command. Uh, so, what else we got? A whole shoreline all the way up here. Sylvan Hounds amongst Silvari. Another cannon here with a, a Priory Arcanist. Oh, it looks like the next wave was over here. We're coming, guys. Did we proc one of our Flesh Reavers already? I think we might have. Oh, right out on this dock here. All the way out on this pier. Here we go. Let's use our Flesh Golem. Charge through. Oh, they're just getting hammered. Look at how strong we are. This is cool. This is like, imagine if Claw Island had just been built and we were ready for it. There, I think you just saw the ship sieged us. Uh, there you could see something in the sky. And there you could see something in the sky uh, amongst our airships out there. Traherne, are we okay with this? Hmm. All right. Uh, what happened? Did it? Oh, look, 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 look. The ship actually launched siege, which had undead that came and just catapulted inside us. And now the miasma falls. Oh no, and a dragon comes close! We've lost the cannons! Ravens, beasts, and ducks are defenseless! Oh dear, the docks are defenseless! It's no good, run for it! Okay, I'm out, I'm out. Everybody come back in. Thing is, I don't like the idea of abandoning all of our troops. So the cannons get destroyed, so the boats can't be counter sieged. Ah, oh, it's so crazy that Zaitan has air, land, and sea together. You can see why pa uh, Traherne has his mind on doing something similar for the pact. Get land, air, and sea too. So retreating here into more of an inner sanctum as everybody fights there. We will be back for you guys. I know, the cannons are defenseless. Right, so let's kick this. Slowly retreat. Don't worry, there are many layers of defense. Another gate comes down. Are you sure we can strike back tenfold, Traherne? Mother, 
Forgive me. Oh god. I mean, imagine how heavy your conscience would be knowing that all these people are dying, fighting for you and your cause and your idea. None of them would be here if you didn't tell them to fight the dragon. No time to lose. We need to secure the underwater gate. And now, you're in a position where they're sacrificing themselves for you and you have that doubt you don't know whether it will whether everything will pull through Trahan, do you change your dialogue nope okay uh so we move through uh this is an interesting bit for what it's worth <clears throat> because the devs seem to have cut a section of the instance out where uh, I can imagine we should be fighting it. Look, there's arrow carts, all kinds of things uh, waged here. But maybe they felt the instance got too long or something. I don't know. Uh, but you really don't have to do any fighting here. You just run on through past these guys. And I mean, maybe we can fight these three mobs solo, uh, which at least they've spawned. And they just sort of get ripped to pieces. Uh, but then you just go straight to this gate switch here. So this is at the airship dock. Uh, and the underwater gate, as he describes it. And we just move through that phase very, very, very quickly. And look at this. Oh, I love that gate. That gate is awesome. We so rarely see those kinds of animations on that. Oh, brilliant. Okay. This scholar beckons to us. Hello. The enemy has the ore. They're heading for the Asura gates. Somebody stop them. Oh my god, okay, so wait, they got the orb? Wait, where what even was the orb? We didn't even see it. Sire took it to Trahan, and then where did Trahan take it? I honestly have no idea. Hold on, let's let's take these guys out and get a move on nice and quick. Did that Priory Scholar get killed there? I'm not sure if he did. That gate there, you know, it's already shut. That's to care uh, uh, Apple Orchid. I can't remember what it is in Welsh, uh, which we saw before. Moving over to, to the Asura gates. Right, uh, yes, no orb is pretty bad. We still have explosives. Uh, we need reinforcements from the gates. This will save us, but we have malfunctions here. Right, remember, all the little things that are happening all at once. They have the orb. They look like packed soldiers, but then they changed. By the time I realized they were using illusions, it was too late. If they get the gates working, we'll lose them and the orb. We need explosives to get through. Oh my god. Okay, they're escorting the orb through the gates. I love the way that those things get blended together. Okay, um, so here we need to get a bomb to breach the gate since it's already closed and uh, deal with these Zaitan spies. I've got all the firepower you need. Ton made these bombs. And he's one of the best. Ton? Who the hell is Ton? I don't care. Give me the bomb. There is an ample supply of bombs ready to be deployed. Let's grab one. You can hear it hissing as well. It's brilliant. Okay, here we go, guys. Plant it down. We drop it over here. Uh, very early game humans will recognize using bombs like this. One. Is that good? Oh, look at the animation. Kill the Mesmer infiltrators. Your pact is finished. Your orb, your fortress, and your Asura gates belong to us. And check it out, it's a female char, Siska, or just another vision of Siska. But it is undead. It's so cool, guys. It's so, so, so badass. If we actually look at the design here, she doesn't look undead, but we're guessing she is. We can't lose the orb now. Keep them away from me. Look, look, look. When she dies, she turns into a wraith. Look at that. That's so badass. And here we go. So the orb, good. Oh, I'm uh, glad you will. Uh, check it out. We get two char and a Norn immediately. And then the waves of pact just start coming through. Look at this. Way back home in central Tyria. Way back in central Tyria. They've just been watching and waiting. And now we can flow out like a plague of our own. Hey, guys. I've got the orb. Move on past me, please. Again, the way they're positioned, it's like they're trying to body block. Pretty cool. I think that one's more for flavor instead of gameplay, though. Arrow carts up here. Perhaps we can put to you soon. Oh, God, the shaking. Because <laughs> you just know there's a dra that dragon's flying really low as well. And here we go in the central pillar. Does Trahan say anything before I do this? No, here we go. Let's place the orb inside. And see if we can fight back Zaitan's influence. <sighs> Suck it, dragon. Yeah, look at the Asura tech and stuff in that. And now the blue energy flows out and we can see the skies clearly once again. Take back Fort Trinity Center is our next objective. How you doing, dude? Very good. Would have thought he'd say something at that point. All right, so let's uh, charge on through. We got a ton of allies here and uh, I really like the devs take on this one. You know, 
it doesn't feel like our back's against the wall anymore. Not, not after you make those little victories there. You counter each of Zaitan's little plans. And you have such a huge wave of allies. These guys are even still fighting down here on the docks a little bit. The longer you take on the instance, the harder this next bit is. Because if you're quick, this fight can still be going on. But look at this. Look at all the allies we have charging in. Yes, there is a, a heap of undead here. I don't know, I mean, a true heap. But we can kind of float in on our own, and it's, it's really, really awesome. There's kind of an interesting mechanical side of it as well that I, I feel like I want to talk about. Early in the story, the devs are very cautious with adding too many NPCs and enemies to story instances. Now, I think what that is, is it's server issues and uh, concerns that when the game launched, if you have hundreds of thousands of players playing Guild Wars 2, or even tens of thousands of players, all doing the story all at once in those early game story steps, you might, if you have too many NPCs and uh, whatnot in them, it could bag everything down. But once you get to late game story, because the player base will spread out by the time they all get there, everyone has their own pace of playing through the game, you can kind of trust that there won't be some huge spike of stress of, you know, the, the game servers organizing so many different NPCs and enemies across so many different instances. So they're okay with it, you know. But here we go, the last couple. Let's take them out. And victory was in our grasp. For more than 100 years, ore has been lost. Despoiled, corrupted, ruined by the presence of a dragon, an infection withering the heart of Tyria. Fort Trinity symbolizes our determination. It stands as a mark of our unity against the dragons. From here, we will prevail. We will fight to rend the darkness with steel and flame, always looking toward the door. Our victory at Fort Trinity will show the world that we can strike against the dragons. When we are ready, we will prove that even in the Sanctum of Ore, they are not untouchable. We can reach the dragon's lair in the heart of Ore. We can assault Ara. We can destroy Zaitan before the dragon's infection claims us all. This battle is over. We can triumph. But the war has just begun. So there you hear Zaitan roar at the end of the cutscene. I'm glad we've got the dragon's attention. I want Zaitan to know the names and faces of those who will defeat it. Fort Trinity is secure for now, so if you have no objections, I'd like us to turn our attention to Lion Guard Apatia. Oh God, yeah. Thank you, sir. I know she's still in that great city somewhere. She helped us secure the orb. We owe it to her to get her out. Agreed. I'll wrap things up here and form a rescue party. We'll meet you near the Restless Deeps. Oh, we spent a long time with this, though. A very long time. Oh, what a cool cutscene, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, everyone had their doubts about Traherne. One victory at Claw Island does not win a war. This is a second victory. And I think that it's that second victory that gives some real confidence and belief in the people of the pact. I mean, we, we took every aspect of his assault. And we beat him back with it. Here you can see this beautiful airship firing its cannons away there. I think it's still stuck maybe in its battle state. But you can't really even see it that well during the battle. But look at all the airships that are staged above us. Only in this instance do you see all these awesome airships that distracted the dragons in the sky. Took them out. Ah. Oh. But yeah, so with that, let's move back out into the Straits of Devastation. And now, realistically, is when the fort, as we understand it, with the invasions and all of that, really, truly kind of unlocks. Uh, and so, yeah, that's uh, pretty cool. But we do have one more job to do. I love the way that the devs structure this at this point in the game. Let's go back to Oxbow Isle. Uh, essentially, what they've done is they've said... Um, yeah, you get this big climactic story step with the Battle for Fort Trinity, but that comes before the conclusion of the rest of the stuff, you know? Like, they could have easily had it the other way around where you just do everything to do with Apatia all at once, and then the Battle for Fort Trinity is afterwards. But they kind of mix it up a bit, and they have uh, us sort of go back into our specific little branch afterwards. And I really, really like that. But here, so yes, Oxbow Isle, this is where the Order of Whispers base is, it's a little bit further down. Uh, but liberating Apatia, who knows how long it's been since we last saw it. Let's grab this level here, they're going to give us some uh, crafting supplies. And uh, yes, 
Is she out here? Is she okay? Out in the deeps? Remember, we visited one of the uh, deeps, the one up north at Timberline. We've never actually been to the Maya Sea one, which is, you can tell from the map, a lot bigger. Hey, guys. Let me be clear. Our goal here is to find and retrieve our missing comrade, Apatia. This place reeks of Zaitan's touch, so don't take unnecessary chances. Stay alert. We move fast, we stick to the surface, and we stay together. Let's begin. Right, so who have we got here? They're moving really quick. No, 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 I want to talk to you guys. We get a lot of faces we should recognize. Agent Zri is back. Crusader of Farnan My is back. Is and we have um, Explorer Hector. Uh, what's your step, Commander? The water looks like it'd kill you quicker than any blade. I'll be careful. Let's keep going. Hector. Oh, God, I'm under the plank As here. I feared. The water's toxic. Oh dear, yeah. you see how the lighting changes as we get here? That's so gross. Stay out of these waters. I recognize the stench of this particular Orion corruption. It's more toxic than any poison. I wonder if that's what happened to the crate. When I was here before, they were swarming over this whole place. We can't assume they're gone. If the corruption killed them, they likely rose as fresh undead. Follow me, everyone. Single file, and watch your step. I don't want anyone falling into this water. It's nice of Johan to come with us on this as well, by the way, don't you think? Uh, but yeah, we get Zri. I got you covered, Commander. You can keep up with the enemy. I'll keep uh, an eye out on you. Everyone's like walking now. Watch your step. I'll be careful. And Hector says, this place is like a plague pit stuffed inside of a slaughterhouse. It's no place for a Norn hunter. We've got to get a patient out of it. I love that Hector's got a vested interest as a Norn herself. Uh, but yeah, you guys get the story here, right? This deeps without the blue orb, we interrupted their procession. We kind of glossed over it before. But the fact they of the matter is, if we they don't have the orb, they are vulnerable to Zaitan. And so we protect ourselves from corruption, but Zaitan grows his armies anyway by destroying the crate nearby. This, the, all these two deeps. And it's kind of an amazing thing that happens here. First of all, these are all risen crate that have jumped out at us. But um, what you can actually do is take that jump pad and see the Maya Sea before it's completely fallen, corrupted kind of thing, and the lighting is different. And then you come back, uh, what, what do we think the timeline actually is here? I like to think it's about a week, maybe, maybe a little bit less. We come back and, ve or maybe less, maybe the story is cooler to think it's less. Very quickly, Zaitan just slaughters these crate and takes control of them. The se I mean, that means so much that we interrupted their procession. And we don't care because they're crate, but essentially we did doom them all. And it's uh, maybe not the smartest of plans, really. was the only thing protecting these crate from Zaitan's influence. And now it will protect Fort Trinity. So I like the idea that, uh, you know, there were no major Asura brains behind our operation here with the Blue Orb that could have predicted and understood this. Uh, and just the logistics of dealing with that on so many fronts is kind of amazing. Sadly, just as that child said, it would be amazing if we had a ton of orbs. But we don't have a ton of orbs. We only have one. And can we get more? Well, we don't know. What's the nature of the artifact? Is it replicatable? Surely we'll try and replicate it, but... Uh, collecting more from the from the depths of the unending ocean with so few Lagos around to communicate with and speak to. Maybe Sire can tell us more at some point, but, uh, you know, it's just not feasible right now. Anyway, uh, yeah, this uh, instance is kind of cool. It literally is a situation where mechanically, if we go in the water, we do get poisoned and we get toxic toxins on us, cling to our skins, wounding us. Uh, so we have to try and avoid it. And we're going to patrol around on these gangplanks. It's kind of an interesting experience. Nowhere else in the entire game, as far as I remember, has this kind of like thin, narrow walkways right on the surface of the waters. I mean, you get little bits of it. God's Lost Swamp has sort of a feeling, but there's not a literal, oh, you die and or you take damage if you fall off kind of idea. As always with Guild Wars 2, it's very forgiving if you do fall in the water. Uh, I like the idea that it's super dangerous, though, and we're going to do our best not to fall in. Which can be tricky, by the way, because Crate have pulls and fears and things. Uh, and they could easily accidentally get you in there. Well, here's one of their side rooms. Lots of cages. Prisoners here. Think of this. You're trapped in one of those cages, tormented by the Crate. You see the Crate get slaughtered by tides of undead rising up around them. And then you think you might be all right, and then the Risen just climb up these, Pirates of the Caribbean style, jump on your cage, and rip your throat out. And now you are also under... I mean, it would have been really cool if in this instance there were, you know, corrupted packed slaves now turned undead. 
uh, as well, because realistically, that's what would have been happening, though. Look at all the cages just hanging and bobbing around. Maybe a soul survivor here. All right, so, yeah, we're just going to keep patrolling, try and take out these undead, and a Pacia is somewhere here, a soul survivor. The odds don't look good, guys. Love that animation. Love them jumping out of the waters here. So badass. You can kind of tell that the devs probably created that as a thing to respawn them in, in the open world. Because that, that's true. So many different enemies in the game have special animations where, like, they're a spider and they come down from a tree. Or, you know, they uh, emerge from some kind of bush if they're a rat. And I think that this was created for the, the crate to naturally respawn around the world. And then they use it here as they aggressively dive bomb us. And the water is just murky enough that you can't really look down there. Even though you know there is gameplay down there. There are explorable places. Alright, getting towards the central structure now. This place is littered with undead. We have to fight our way to the top. Oh, God, this feels familiar, climbing up. Uh, it's, maybe it's just me, but it feels like as we climb this one, it's not as wet and slippery anymore. The idea that the crate, <laughs> I don't know, don't frequent it anymore. It's just rotting and the wood is all dying away and it all feels very dry. That obviously makes no sense since the Risen that attacked them came from the water. And up, and Risen crate would still go in and out of the water. But I don't know, maybe their habits and the way they move around has changed sufficiently now that they just sort of amble about and meander around and don't move much at all anymore. I mean, that's a creepy idea of Undead, right? That not many RPGs deal with well enough, I think. It's just the, the fact that in Undead, things are perfectly happy to be stagnant and stationary for months on end until finally there's some, some intruder or something for them to do. It depends what the Call of Zaitan is asking. They're probably mustering and then launching counterattacks and stuff. Probably looking for Fort Trinity more than anything else now. All right. <clears throat> if we can claim this, though, it's one less foothold Zaitan has deeper in. At least until some random artifact of his gets found, like we saw way back when with uh, the amulet amongst Ascalon. And then, and then you have other problems on your hands. Ugh. Right, the story is saying we've got to keep climbing. Now, finding the right route might be tricky. It seems like this is a good one. They really bring a patient all the way to the top. We heard before with Warden Highwall that high-ranking, uh, highly-valued slaves are pulled to the highest cages. But look, all of them are just broken and ripped apart. There, we've got uh, something dangerous. The head slaver, Nymphasa. Oh, what a cool name. Nymphasa. How do we get up to you, Nymphasa? Do we climb on this and then... Ah, here we go, here we go. This is it. What have you done with Apatia? Where is she? There's nothing but death all around. Alright, so this is a champion. Pretty dangerous, actually. Once again, we've lost all of our minions. So I'm actually going to pop all of my minion skills to kill as many as I can. Now, two of them won't die. But by doing that... Um, we can respawn some of the other ones. It takes a while, but here, the Fiend is coming up now. The Flesh Golem. Come to join your friend. She has a I'm bleeding. A fish wasn't it? She gave us a name. Between all the screaming, all the claiming. I have consume you all. Victory is yours. I see but her. A She's in that is ours. We'll have to climb down to reach her. There should be a beam connecting to her cage. God, a faint and just giving no craps. Not even letting the death whale of the crate finish. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, undead crate. Seem to. Oh, my God, look at that face. Look at that eye. I have to zoom in on that. That is freaky. Oh, dear. Okay, this doesn't seem good. The crate have been taunting us about a patient every opportunity. Is that just because they're evil incarnate or what? Evil incarnate. Corrupted by something else evil incarnate. I mean, what do we expect? Someone sees her where lower down damn we miss more crate over here I'm fast as the wind the presence I sensed is up this beam It may be the source of all this corruption I am mighty. Okay, uh, Trahan, I think you're talking about the boss that we already killed there mate. Don't you worry. I guess we just weren't standing in the right place when the dialogue was supposed to trigger low down. Protected. Very fun. Okay. 
With the slaver down, though, their head slaver, does that mean that uh, Zaitan's grip on the place will sort of ease with no bodies here left? I mean, the idea I like is that we could come through here and just torch the whole place to the ground. Torch all the bodies, torch all the wood, torch everything. How did we get up there before? Oh, my God, the deeps are so difficult to do. Oh, no, it wasn't up there. It's across here, maybe? we got to climb to locate a Apatia's cell. No, it's not across that bridge, but how cool is that? The secondary and tertiary... Uh, areas of the deeps connected by long rickety bridges. Such a cool idea. Uh, is it this pole? I mean, it's so scary, guys. If we fall, we're so screwed. That we won't die. Just take a bit of damage. All the way up here. Here we go. This is it. Apatia. Apatia, it's safe and clean and fine now. We're here to save you. I'm sorry I had to leave for Fort Trinity. You can blame Sire. Here she is. She's in the cage. I see her. But she doesn't look very good. By the pale tree, Zaitan's corruption has claimed Apatia as well as the crate. Is she aware? Is Apatia still in there suffering? Or is she just a mindless husk? Either way, this is a cruel end for a noble hunter. It doesn't have to be the end. Having an undead captive to study, especially one we knew well, could be a huge boon to the Pact. Don't be ridiculous. There's nothing here that we couldn't get from any one of a thousand other undead. Apatia's gone, and we have to set her spirit free. And when we're done here, we travel to Holbrecht to tell her legend to the Skald so she'll be remembered forever. That is the Norn way. Very well. Apatia admired you greatly, Commander, so you should be the one to put her to rest. Then, to Holbrecht. Oh, this is a turn up for the books. I, there's so much I love about that cutscene. A Farnan, a kind of, um, again, it's this thing about social graces, right? That idea that she just doesn't understand that people might be looking for a little bit of solace and comfort in Apatia's turning. So Zri is like, oh, no, we can study her. But Afana's just like, no. A, a, a thousand undead, it would be exactly the same. She just doesn't care. It's amazing. It's so sad. We all have a place in the eternal alchemy, even you. All right, they haven't updated. But you can hear very sad music, and Apatia is indeed in there. And if you look at her, she is done for. Well, this is sort of what Cara Flower feared, someone close to her being left to suffer. And so here we can look at the cage, open it up. Apatia staggering around. You'll notice she doesn't mindlessly attack us. I like to think that this might be some aspect of her still within there. We're going to release Apatia's spirit and end her suffering. Rest well, brave Norn. May the spirits of the wild guide you to the mists. Marshal Traherne, should we accompany you to Holbrook? Not necessary. You three return to Fort Trinity. The commander and I will take it from here. And so, yeah, um, this is why, well, one of the reasons why I wanted to open this video with the other crusader, Crusader Aliana, whose soul, whose spirit was not trapped inside the body, but here, we seem to think that Apatia's might have been, and we wanted to release her. But is that just for our own benefit, or what? Uh, so, yes. And then, this whole stuff about Holbrek. Guys! We're finally going to Holbrek after so long. Thank you for suggesting we return to Holbrek. Apatia deserves a proper send-off, and this is the perfect way to give it to her. It's the Norn way. Their deeds live on in songs and stories. Then that's what Apatia shall have. Our invasion of Ore is almost ready to begin, but before it does, we must honor the fallen and inspire those that remain. So, I mean, if you are playing as a Norn in this game, this is just such a beautiful story step to do because it just feels so natural and realistic for your character to turn and say, no, we will speak of her at Holbrek. You'll recall as well, um, if you played the Vigil storyline, uh, we swear we will tell of Forgal's legends, but the game doesn't really give us an opportunity to do that. Well, here with Apatia, at least it does, and it's kind of a beautiful thing. My it's just the same thing that I credit with the uh, other storyline Tyrix just did, where we go back to Fireheart Rise. It's like the devs, at some talent at the uh, company, realized at this point it would be great to like feed back in the early stuff just a bit as we make that progression at whatever opportunity they can. And they do that here. So Holbrack, the final big city we have not even seen yet. Well, we're going to have to travel up the grey road I showed you in Dredge Haunts. And I guess no time like the present. Uh, these guys say, Apatia was a fine soldier. I hope our hunt continues in the mist. It will. And we'll continue to sing of her. Knowledge is the greatest treasure. And here's Apatia. Uh, sorry, Hector. 
who didn't even have that much to say there, really. Thank you for setting a patient free. When Zaitan falls, I'll drain an entire keg dry in one pull to honor her bravery. She'd like that. Now, that idea that uh, some talent realized it might be a cool idea to go back to Holbrack. If you replay this or rewatch this video, listen to the music in the cutscene a second ago. You'll hear it go sad music. And then when the Holbrack idea comes up, the, com the music completely cuts out. And then when the whole Brack conversation's done, the sad music comes back. And I'm 99% confident that because of that background, the music, they just quickly added it in after the original mission was made. As a sudden thing, they were like, oh, that'd be a cool idea. And they just didn't do it fully. And the music is kind of wonky there. That's my work in theory anyway. Right, so up to the Grey Road and the Great Lodge in Holbrack as we move. God, this area of the Shiver Peaks is gorgeous, isn't it? Oh my lord. It's kind of amazing how much time Cara Flower has ended up spending here in the Shiver Peaks. So much of us, which I'm so familiar with it. And if that's not interesting enough, which I certainly think so, even cooler is that we've spent so long here, but not even seen one of the main bastions and hubs of civilization and society, that being Holbrack. Not until now. So the dredge infested lands of dredge haunt cliffs, uh, moving back up beyond, uh, you know, right below our feet. We could really think of Sorry's Furnace here, really. Uh, we're going to follow this road all the way along, past a few packed outposts and bases, past the Granite Citadel and Priory Operations there, way up north until Holbrack is on the end. Of course, I'll note at this point as well that what Caraflower could quite feasibly do is... Now that Fort Trinity Asura gates are up and running, uh, take an Asura gate to the Priory and walk to Holbrack from there, or take an Asura gate to the Priory, nip into Lion's Arch, and then an Asura gate from Lion's Arch to Holbrack. So while in the show I'm showing you this kind of beautiful long ambient walk up through Dredgehorn, uh, in the story, this doesn't necessarily have to take a really long time. Uh, with that kind of very rapid transportation, it's not like it's unrealistic people would go back to do stuff like this or that Traherne would come with us when he's so busy because realistically in the story, it doesn't really have to take that long. I just want to show you this nice walk because come on, it's a beautiful walk. And these areas of Dredgehorn being a place in the game you wouldn't otherwise get to see in the series. All right, here we are. Some of Jormag's corruption. Sons of Sfarno around. Up more towards the northern shivers. Here we go. Through the portal to the great city of Holbrook. Holbrook has become the social center of the Norn race. When the Elder Dragon Jormag drove Norn ancestors out of the far shiver peaks, the spirits of the wild, bear, raven, wolf, and snow leopard, guided them to this area. And now, great halls dedicated to those spirits dominate the settlement. Oh, what a place. Now, there's some beautiful depictions of Holbrack uh, in Destiny's Edge, the second novel. There's all kinds of cool things we can talk about here. A number of different aspects of Norn society and civilization. But I do kind of want to get a bit of a move on. Uh, so the main thing what we're going to do is just tease ourselves and look out at the distance. Uh, but staying mostly at this enormous building here. Now, I've mentioned it many times, the scale of what the Norn construct is really their big defining feature. And, well, check it out. This is the Great Lodge of Holbrack. It is the big place. This is where Newt White Bear rules from. And you can see right above it, there is a beautiful glimmering symbol in the sky of what we're about to discover is something of a tooth. Looking out here, that's the rest of Holbrack. And indeed, yes, guys, this is just like Divinity's Reach or the Black Citadel in that this is a main hub for the playable races of Tyria, this time being the Norn. And here we are visiting it on a very small little uh, Asura, who you may recall in her earliest moments in the world stumbled upon another Silvari. Did I just say Asura? Silvari who uh, was talking in the grove about how just being in the cold areas withered her and she could feel energy sapping from her. Uh, kind of cool. So, yeah, we'll move along. Uh, here we've got an Asura gate, and this Asura gate will be our ticket to get back down south nice and quick. I'll do that exact route I was talking about. We'll go to Lion's Arch, straight through the Durban Priory, and then up into Fort Trinity. 
Uh, but now we're going to come down to these lower areas. I could have maybe gone down some of these ramps as well. But getting the uh, waypoint near the Asura Gate uh, is kind of useful. Uh, we'll move through. There's lots of crafters. All kinds of different Norn we can speak to and their dialogue. So much to learn about these people. Uh, but really, I've just got one thing on my mind. And that is Honor Apatia. Here through these giant doors. And I mean really enormous doors that are slightly cracked. We can come on in and continue our story to liberating Apatia. Where we can... Bring together the biggest crowd we can conceive of amongst the Norn to talk about her legend and honor her in death. Here in the Great Hall, you'll find we just saw a representation of it. A large tooth hanging from three chains. And this tooth is a pretty big part of the Norn story. Uh, which I guess we will see if anyone talks about as we move over. Hey, Trahern. We're at the Fang of the Serpent. He's gathered a pretty big crowd of locals, elders, merchants. How's it going, man? Perhaps people close to Apatia? Hear me, Holbreg. I sing of Apatia and the legend she forged. She was many things. A lion guard, a soldier, a hero, a friend. She joined the pact because fighting one dragon was not enough. She was determined to fight them all. Jormag, Zaitan, and any that follow. She repeatedly proved her valor and worth at Claw Island, killing scores of undead and saving hundreds of innocent lives. Moreover, she helped recover an artifact that now shields Fort Trinity from Zaitan's influence. She gave us a footing we need to strike down the dragon. Apatia's life ended on that mission, but her glorious legend lives on. Now, Hear the words of the last person to fight by her side. Oh god, what do we say? Commander? Let the bards sing, and the Skalds proclaim her glorious name forever. Join me now, until the Shiver Peaks themselves ring with the sound. Apatia! Hail Apatia! Apatia! Her legend will live on! Yeah! Sing it, Norn! Don't you forget her. Don't let your children forget her. She did something pretty... I mean, de genuinely, you might think, oh, she's just a random member of the pack. No, that thing about the orb is kind of true. That's like a pretty incredible story right there. I love the idea of Apatia as well as caring about fighting all the dragons. As a member of the Lion Guard, she would have interacted with so many races, not just playable races, but like the Quaggan and all those guys who would have talked and been, you know, displaced by so many of the dragons and that sort of melted pot would have made her want it to kill them all, especially as a badass Norn. Uh, so yeah, we get to sing of her praises. Um, we can speak to, oh, we can't even speak to Traherne here. And that's it. We just get a moment to sort of humbly sit back, look back at what's at stake. Re remember the world and the people who live here before making the march to awe. Indeed, you'll notice we have no story anymore. This is a big moment here, guys, because we are now at the point where we need to be level 80 to continue the story. Level 80 is the final chapter of the game. The final stuff. And, well, there's some big things to get through. Uh, so just before we move on, let's talk a little bit about this tooth here as well. Uh, this is a single tooth of an elder dragon. One of our first hints of the dragons themselves. And it's here in Holbrack because... Oh, all right, we are back. So, what did Chohan want us to do? Meet packed demolitionist Ton near the Splintered Coast. Right, he's done a lot of stuff since Concordia. Well, I guess we can go on that adventure. Uh, Bracked here at the south of Blood Tide again. Uh, perhaps reminiscing, ruminating, looking at this commander to avenge, this risen commander, uh, trying to avenge Tibble. Maybe this is stuck with him in some horrible way. Uh, well, once again, our job is to go south to head toward Fort Trinity. Well, how about this time? We come to the south of the Blood Tide Coast into the bogs, the dangerous mires of Spark Fly Fen. Instead of taking the mountain routes, we've had enough of those. We can travel this way and find, oh look, the territory of another great dragon. <sighs> this isn't going to be easy. This is a great map and there's a ton to talk about as we move on south. I'll see you guys for that next time. to another. I wonder 
should be here in the northern I welcome his strong arm and wild battle cries any day. Don't know him. Oh, not from Holmbreck then. No. My family had a lodge north of there until the dragon came.